May the grace, mercy, and peace that come from God the Father be yours through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, at times we come into your presence not realizing who you are, creator, redeemer, sanctifier. We are not mindful of what you have done. Lord, through your word today, wake us up to your power and majesty and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It was uh, at a college. It was finals time. And in this one particular class, the professor came in he handed out the final exam and he told the class by 1155 I want all the tests on my desk any test that comes in after 1155 will not be counted and you will get a failing grade for the class so students basically busily wrote their exams 11.55, all the exams were there on the professor's table except that of one student. At 11.59, he comes waltzing up with his paper and the professor said, didn't you understand the instruction? And the student said, yeah, I understood. But do you know who I am? And the professor said, no, I don't know who you are. And the, prof and the student said, well, that's good. And he took the papers, put his in. <laughs> Have a good day, professor. <laughs> now I got your attention. We come to homework time. It's a good transition, college to homework. Uh, if you could take a pen or a pencil or an old lipstick or a felt tip marker, anything, and take down these references, that later on you can reread them and kind of be reminded what I've gone on about here. Exodus chapters 19 and 20, Job chapters 38 and 39, Psalm 8, and Isaiah chapter 40. I'll say them again for you who are slow writing. Exodus chapters 19 and 20, Job 38 and 39, Psalm 8, and Isaiah chapter 40. And you'll see, as we get into the sermon, you'll see why these passages are important. They all answer the question of God, God asking, do you know who I am? If we look in scripture, we find there are quite a few instances where God is basically asking, do you know who I am? Moses was out herding his father-in-law's sheep in Midian. And he came on this bush, which was burning, but not consumed. And this was God in the burning bush. And in this encounter, God tells Moses to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses tried every which way to get out of doing what God wanted. He said, oh God, uh, I don't know your name, or I, they, they're not going to believe I talked to you. And finally, Moses says, and God, you got to get somebody else, because I'm not a good speaker. Well, God heard all these complaints, and it was really grinding his gears. And God said, who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In effect, God was saying, do you know who I am? These things are in God's power. To hear or not hear, to see or not see, he controls that. 
so he could make Moses a good speaker. Through the prophet Isaiah, God said, Do you not know, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Isaiah is saying, hey people, listen up. Have you not heard about your great God? Do you not know him? He created the world, and he watches over his creation and the people he created. In the book of Job, we have another do you know who I am moment. Job has indeed suffered greatly. His friends come and they say, Job, come on, fess up. You had to have done something really wrong to get God this ticked off at you. Obviously, Job has committed some big sin, but Job contends that he is a righteous man and he doesn't know why God has come down on him so hard. And finally, God has enough of Job's whining and God says, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man that I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what was the footing set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place? When I said, this is as far as you may come and no farther? Here is where your proud waves halt. This is almighty God speaking. He is the one who created the heavens and the earth by the power of his word. We could stand here and shout our lungs out all day long and we could not create so much as a grain of sand. But God spoke and the heavens were populated with countless stars. God spoke a word and all the animals were there. God spoke a word and all the trees were there and plants. God spoke a word and the oceans were filled with, sea, with fish. And these are just a few examples to show that our God is great and powerful beyond imagination. Just uh, about a week ago, a little over a week ago, we talked about Jesus and the suffering he went through on the cross for us, for our sins, because of our sin. And Pastor Tutwiler described in great detail what Christ suffered for us. Who could have done this if not God? It's very clear from scripture that God hates sin and that all sin must be punished. But God knew that we could not endure that. So he sent Jesus to suffer and die in our place. John the Baptist recognized Jesus. Jesus was walking by. John called out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus did for us what only God could do. Moses, under God's guidance, led the Israelites out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, on dry ground, and to Mount Sinai. And God was about to give the people his law. Moses prepared the people for what was coming, 
And when God, then God came down on Mount Sinai. And we read, on the morning of the third day there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very, a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace. The whole mountain trembled violently and the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder. The Israelites were at the foot of the mountain and they saw and heard everything that was happening. They saw this mighty demonstration of God's awesome power. We read, when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. The Israelites were overwhelmed by this display of God's power and might. It was at this time that God gave the Ten Commandments. And the second commandment is, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Or we may have learned it, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The people I worked with in West Africa <coughs> said, or do not call God's name uselessly or carelessly. Our brothers and sisters who are at the 930 service <coughs> and speak Spanish would say, no tomarás el nombre del Señor tu Dios en vano. It doesn't matter what language you speak. The message is the same. <coughs> God says, don't mess with my name. It's another, do you know who I am statement. Yet what do you hear all over the world, and I mean literally all over the world, you hear people using God's name in vain. You go to the Ashantis in Ghana, and you hear them, Iwaradzi, Iwaradzi, oh Lord, Lord. They want nothing to do with God, but they use his name in vain. In France, you cannot walk down the street without hearing, mon Dieu, mon Dieu, my God. And here, what is the, song, the saying of the day? Oh my God, oh my God. Even uh, if you text, you, there's an abbreviation, OMG. So you don't have to write out, oh my God. You can take God's name in vain with only three letters. Uh, you think God's happy about this? I don't think so. But some people may say, well, God has chilled out and he doesn't get bothered now when we use his name carelessly. Or does God say, well, times have changed and they don't mean anything by it. I don't think so. I think God says, do you know whose name you're messing with? Do you know who I am? God's name is still as holy and awesome today as it was when God came down on Mount Sinai. All right. And it grieves him when we use his name carelessly. When we step foot in church, what thoughts go through our mind? Do we first check the altar to see if there's communion ware there? Because you know, when it's communion, oh, the service gets so long. Or do we hope that the sermon, the pastor's sermon is not really, really long because I want to get home and catch all three hours of the Cubs pregame show. Or I don't want to miss out if the Sox happen to win another game. Do we ever think 
that we are coming into the awesome presence of Almighty God. Do we think that, that we are in the presence of the one who created us? Do we think of being before the one who loved us so much that he gave his son to die for us? Are we filled with a sense of awe when we enter the sanctuary? When Moses met with God at the burning bush, we read, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see what this strange sight is. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from the, within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he didn't want to look at God. Perhaps when we enter the sanctuary, we do not have the same profound sense of awe that Moses had. But we are coming into the presence of the same awesome, majestic God. We are not in the presence of a dumbed down version of God. No, we have the real deal with us. But the way we act in church some, sometimes, we can imagine God asking, do you know who I am? Do you know whose house you're in? When we pray in the service, we're not just performing some liturgical task. We are bringing our concerns to a God, a living and true God who hears our prayers. All right. We read, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. God listens to our prayers. He invites our prayers and he responds to our prayers. When we come to communion, we meet the same God at the altar. And there we receive the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died in our place. He rose from the dead. And then God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When we begin to comprehend the glory and majesty of God, we begin, to, we begin to wonder how he even has time for us. He's so big, he's so wonderful. But the psalmist says, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. This is God's love in action. When we sinned, he forgave us. When we had no hope, he gave us Jesus Christ. When we faced only eternal death, he gave us eternal life in Christ. Now if he asks us, who do you know I am? Or how do, do you know who I am? You have the answer. You are an awesome God beyond all imagination. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen.